Fabian, I'm so glad we're doing this. Welcome to the AOC podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to uh, to delving into into my past in cricket and and what that entails for me today. You know, to be perfectly honest, I'm a, just a little bit nervous about our discussion. It's not necessarily because of who I'm speaking to, but it's because of what the two of us will be speaking about. I first came across your story in an article written by Sam Dowling. And uh, Sam, I mean, if you're listening to this, thank you so much for supporting All Over Cricket and being one of our first subscribers. We haven't forgotten about you and we'll link your article in the show notes. So it, it was that. And then a few, oh, I would say five or six weeks ago, I, I came across your episode two of the Between the Ears podcast. And, you know, like, like, like I told you in our, in our messages, it, it felt like you were telling my story in a way. So with, with this podcast, you mm. know, obviously, I think everyone wants to hear your story. But if we're going to do something different and, you know, I, for the first time in a public forum, I plan to open up about my struggles with mental health, addiction, and, and how cricket, cricket featured into that, especially in my childhood. So it's, it's exciting, but I'm nervous because I'm vulnerable right now. <laughs> but yeah, it's difficult to be, it's difficult to be vulnerable, but um, I think for me, the realization is when you're honest with people, um, not only do you come off as more authentic, but you're actually able to deal with things um, more openly and, and, and it helps you progress in your own life. Um, if you've got everything working emotionally uh, and mentally, everything else tends to fall into place. So me, me holding on to, onto my past and, and um, delving into my own traumas by myself without voicing them um, would be detrimental to, to my mental health. So if I can use some of my stories and some of my experiences to help other people, which I'm trying to do actively now. I'm now a qualified life coach. Um, so I support people in transformation and transition, um, which is something that I'm very passionate about and also the transferable skills from sport into other walks of life. So, um, but I, I do think that it's important that we all continue to speak about these things. And if, if only just to help other people as well as ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll, we'll touch on more on what you're doing with Cal Corner and what you're doing as a life coach later in the podcast. Just to just to kick things off, just talk to us about what was it like growing up as a Cowdery and, you know, your, your relationship with your dad in, in, in your first, you know, when you first started playing cricket. Yeah, I mean, I was I was born into a very famous cricketing dynasty, as as lots of people know, um, and it was it was fantastic growing up. I mean, I had a former England cricket captain to to talk to about various different things about cricket. I used to watch lots of sports with him on the sofa. We had a real father son bond. Um, I mean, I remember playing games, and and Dad tried to shelter me from the expectation of the Cowdery surname by hiding behind trees because he didn't <laughs> at matches because he didn't really want me to understand the gravitas that came with the name so I, I was very much a normal kid um i sort of didn't i sort of overlooked people arriving at my games randomly to watch me even at school because it happened a lot um and i just thought nothing of it i was just enjoying cricket um cricket was very much my escape and love absolutely loved it and um from some interesting times growing up on the playground where i was a bit different i always threw myself into creative avenues as opposed to intellectual avenues like science and maths, which I was terrible at. Um, apart from sort of calculating my cricket average, I was pretty poor at maths. And I was at a, at a very academic school and, you know, grow, growing up trying to use sport as that get out of jail card um, was very real to me. And um, yes, it, it had it had its pressures being born into, into the Cowdery family. But in my early years, they were only positive things. And I really, I really enjoyed having my dad around. Yeah, you, you just mentioned something about using cricket as your get out of jail card. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, abs absolutely. I think it was something where I used sport as an emotional freedom. Like when I crossed the white line to go and play cricket, I'd make sure that I batted the full fifty overs, or I was having a big part to play in the field, so I didn't have to come off the field because there were two very different feelings for me. 
um, one off the park where I didn't really necessarily feel accepted for for who I was or what I was. And there was a lot of journey of self-discovery as there is for everyone when you're young. Um, and cricket was that get out of jail. It was you feel completely at peace. You feel completely yourself. And I, I was a bit of a schoolboy cricketing prodigy. So I did pretty well on the cricket pitch. So it filled me with a lot of confidence. And um, I just absolutely loved it growing up. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think there was something in your podcast where at some point in your cricketing journey, I feel like we're fast forwarding a few years here. Uh, I believe your your parents split up. Mm-hmm. And um, after a while, you and your father, I guess, uh, you start to grow apart um, a mm-hmm. little bit. So, you know, for, just just talk us through going through, you know, I guess, for lack of a better word, good times as as mm. a child and the the change from that to, I guess, your your teenage or your, your early 20s and, and how all that played out. Yeah, sure. Well, it, as as a son uh, normally has with his father, the, the father's the the invincible hero and completely perfect in every way as you grow up. And then as you you go through those teenage years when things are transitioning personally and um, and also emotionally um, as you progress that you realize that everyone's a bit more human than you first gave them credit for. Um, when I was 18, I signed my first professional contract. Um, on the evening after that conversation with the CEO at Kent, I, I had a chat with my mom and my brother who who very, very rudely and abruptly walked into me when I, when I was in the bath. So I had to cover, cover the bath with loads of bubbles because I was like, look, I'm an adolescent male. Can you please give me five minutes just to finish washing? And they were like, no, 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 we've got to talk to you. So I was like, oh my God, okay. Um, and they then revealed that, you know, mum and dad were, were separating. And that was really, that was almost like I'd been on the high, the euphoria of, of achieving chi- of this childhood dream, worked my whole life, you know, used cricket as that escape goat really from some darker times growing up. And suddenly I was a professional sportsman, which was which was crazy. And then on the same day of being told that my hero or, you know, my my father, who I'd always looked up to, um, was breaking up with with my mother. Um, and that caused some fairly difficult times for me in my early career because I didn't really have any where to turn, really. When I when I visited Kent County Cricket Ground, if you've been there, you'll know that there's um, um there's a stand named after my grandfather, the Colin Cowdery stand. And then the Stuart Cheeseman Pavilion, which is where the players all change. Um, that is my great, that's my great grandfather from the other side of the family. So my, my grandma's side who married into, um, who married Colin. So there was lots of family tradition there. And um, I was reminded of his legacy every time I went to the ground, albeit a very limited com- communication system that I had with him in my early years. And um, when I went home, there was, there was quite a lot of trauma there as well, because it was a broken, broken home. So it left me in a little bit of a crossroads and um, albeit I'm happy for those experiences now because they've taught me who I am. Uh, I wouldn't really wish that, wish that on anyone, to be honest. I guess in a way, the Cowdries are, they're, they're basically mm. Kent royalty. Mm. It, yeah, well, absolutely. And it was um, funny when my dad told me about the autobiography that, that was written um, called Good Enough? Question mark, which was his book. And that was because when he was compared to his father, Colin, um, every time he went to the Kent ground before the start of play, he'd be having some hits in the nets just to prepare for his innings. And you'd get all the county fans come up to him and say, oh, I remember in 1957 when I watched your gram- your father get 300 not out for Kent. And he thought, oh, my, I'm 300 runs short of that. I haven't even had a bat yet. So you can imagine the, the pressures when everyone was reminding him of his father's legacy. Um, so he went through exactly the same, if not, even more intense because his father was, you know, played 114 test matches and averaged 40 plus with 22 test hundreds. So that was slightly different um, for him. But by the same token, I think I was reminded of of the importance of the surname on my debut against a touring New Zealand team when I walked out to bat with my name on my back and the pavilions and the stands and all of that. And um, it was a packed house at Canterbury, maybe seven, eight to 10,000. Um, an intimate grounds and they all applauded me to the wicket and I hadn't even hit a ball in the first team I got a standing ovation and then in that moment you begin to realize that there's something a lot of a lot more important than you going on um, 
And that was the first time I thought, okay, this is this is a bit unique now. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess if there was all that pressure on you, which, which it sounds like it certainly was, at least from the outside looking in, it wouldn't have been apparent to to the casual observer. You started off with a quick fire half century on list day debut. There was a season of of the blast. I believe you were you were partnering partnering Daniel Bell Drummond uh, up at the top of the order, and I think you were averaging somewhere in the high thirties or early forties with the, with a really good strike rate mm. that season as well. And so you know just 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 tell us more about the the early days and what was going on on the field and in your personal life as well in you know your first few seasons at kent i was i was a kid i was living my dream for that first year or two i i was dealing quite well with the the news of my mum and dad i i tried to distract myself from it as much as i could um i was enjoying enjoying my cricket in the first season or two um naive playing with freedom i was given opportunity in the white ball stuff although I didn't necessarily deserve opportunity in the white ball stuff. In the in the second eleven at Kent, I was scoring hundreds in the three day game, in the four day game, um, but wasn't getting many runs in the white ball. And they picked me to play in twenty twenty and asked and asked me to have a slog in the middle overs in my first game. And I did quite well trying to produce shots that I'd never played off before. But to be honest, I I was I was sort of out of place. I felt like I was. I should have been playing in the Red Bull game more so, which frustrated me in a, in a large way because when they did give me opportunities to play in Red Bull, it was for one or two games. And if I didn't perform, I was dropped. So it, I never really had what I felt was the backing that I needed just to give me a chance to learn about first class cricket. So they turned me into a white ball, into more of a white ball cricketer, which was really tough for me. Um, and I did well, at, you're right, I did well at the top of the order and then found the following season they had me down at number number six or seven bowling left arm spin. And I was only, I was a batsman who threw some left arm darts down. So they were consistently trying to change my game to get me in the team. But what, what they didn't realise perhaps at the time was that was having quite a damaging effect on me as a player. Because I was a batsman. I'd scored runs all my life. I'd never, I only started bowling because I got bored fielding. Um, and that was the way that I was always, you know, always played the game I batted at the top people would bat around me and um, I think because I was always shifted around after those early two seasons after some success just so they could get me in the team um, I didn't really have a role I was just sort of a bits and pieces player and I think that affected my confidence quite a lot in the later part of my career and I guess that sort of showed up in your performances as well mm. towards towards your the end of your time at Kent and I, I think it was the eve of the 2017 season. You were aged 24. Uh, yeah. 24. And, and you decided to walk away from the game. Mm. Just, like, how, how did you come to that decision? Was it, uh, was it something you'd been thinking about for a year, year and a half in, in the lead up to it? How, how, how did that materialize? Yeah, you're right. I, I was thinking about, about it for a while. Um, I had an appendicitis in my last season, which knocked me out for a few months. And I remember that season thinking, you know, I I could I would do anything to be away from the ground right now. Um, I was almost asking the universe for an injury. And I got it. I got an appendicitis, which meant I couldn't really leave my bed. And I was, you know, I couldn't really, uh, yeah, I couldn't really get out of bed to play, which at the time was an absolute godsend for me because I didn't want to be there. Um I'd, I'd worked so hard towards this that it was all very confusing in my mind as to why I'd, I had little interest in, in, in performing. I think looking back on it, I put unnecessary pressure on by the time I was 23 or 24, becoming something that my grandfather had become by that age or my dad had become by that age and, and been more of a concrete number in, in the Kent 11. Um, and I only realised that when I look back that I was putting that pressure on myself. But in hindsight, when, when I reflect, I felt like I still, I still had the talent to play. And I still, if, if things have been slightly different, whether that be me being a little bit more sure of myself, more self-belief, um, play with more freedom, but also if I'd been given more opportunities and, and more of a chance to, to, to play where I was used to, to bat where I was used to, to be given a chance at 
the the roles that I've been doing through my youth that I succeeded in instead of being shuffled around so much that who knows maybe there would have been an opportunity for me to still be playing right now um but it got to a stage where I I lost I lost who I was playing cricket whereas cricket had always been my identity I was sort of wondering what I was doing it for anymore um and that became really really low place for me because it was the only thing that made me happy growing up um and I didn't want to get out of bed to play and when I had that injury I was so pleased which sounds ridiculous and quite spoiled in many ways for someone who's making quite good money playing their dream but I didn't want to play anymore and I knew that it was right to my my teammates um but also myself that I don't carry on in that manner um and you're right the performances began began to dip I wasn't I wasn't playing I was you know it was it was a pretty horrific period for me personally for sure yeah absolutely and just to you know relate my my story to that as well so mm. in in no way is this you know on the same scale or or you know does my story have even close to as much publicity but it as as a you know youth level cricketer in in hong kong you know i i feel like i was i was pretty good at the sport as as a child and as a young teenager and for me I guess my upbringing was was my story's a little bit different. So I never really had a great relationship with my father. So for me and there was basically just a lot of of trauma and bereavement when I was growing up as a child in in my home. And for me cricket was a way to get away from that. Um this this trauma and bereavement it manifested in just this anger and it it was just a very emotionally repressed but grieving household that that i grew up in it's not something i felt at the time or realized at the time but it's something i've come to realize in in the last couple of years especially so for me yeah. cricket was my escape from that and just socially as well it took me a little longer to figure out the sort of uh social rules that that come really easy to a lot of children and a lot of teenagers so for me it t- it took me really long to learn all of that and because of my learning disabilities as well i wasn't exactly the strongest student starting off in school so for me cricket was it was my escape and it was it was it was brilliant watching cricket playing cricket i had a i had a autobiography assignment in in the 6th grade and it was supposed to write about ourselves i wrote the whole, the whole thing was about cricket uh, <laughs> the whole thing was about cricket there were pages my top 10 batsmen my top 10 bowlers and my 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 teacher was not very happy with that But in any case the point is cricket was my escape and it was it was my way of getting away from all of that but mm. at at one point I got I picked up an injury playing football of all things and I broke my arm and then I broke another arm I broke my other arm the next year and basically cricket suddenly became this high pressure thing where if I did not do well then I'd have to spend more time at home and it it just there was all this pressure all of a sudden and i went from being part of i think the final 21 for the hong kong under 13 team and be, you know being identified as quite a promising cricketer and i i feel like i had a decent shot of going on that tour as well and that's that you know that's when i kind of started to freeze up a little bit so i'd get to the crease and this is where you know my adhd started to act up and i it's it's i just wouldn't see the ball i i'd be thinking about a million different things mm. i it 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 really hurt my confidence as a bowler as well i for some reason i switched to bowling the flattest yeah. most useless off spin you will ever come across i think it's amazing how we we connect certain sports or certain experiences or um whatever it might be to to sort of suppress something that's a lot deeper going on underneath the surface 
Um, and Ed Smith came up with a good line um, when I heard him speak about it. And it was the former England chairman of selectors. And he said, if you want to be successful, play cricket as if you were a kid without any of that extra pressures going through your head. And I know that they came in slightly earlier for you at age 12 or 13, which is, which is unique, which is unique to you. But um, having that freedom of mind and having that perspective and understanding, you know, it's, and, and that freedom just to go out there without feeling like you're going to freeze because you're associating something to, to, to previous trauma or an escape from somewhere. And you know, that, that's what, that's what happened in, in many ways. Looking back is, um, cricket was my escape growing up and it wasn't my escape um, once mum and dad separated it became something different to me um, and I think from there from then on um, as you get a little bit older you begin to to realize why why certain things happened and uh, there's a lot of reflection but I completely understand the uh, the synchronicity between our journeys for sure you mentioned pressure just now and I think I read this in either mm. Sam's piece or I heard it at the podcast, but you wanted to captain England, right? Yeah, I, I was, I mean, from age five or six, I remember my dad giving me my first bat and I was putting linseed oil on it and I was, you know, telling him to throw me balls in the garden, even when he was busy working in the office and just annoying him really. Um, and from <laughs> that moment on, that was, that was all I wanted to do. I used to have dreams about walking out at Lords, and, you know, that's all I ever wanted to do. Um, so as, as you can imagine, when it got to 18, when I signed that contract, that was, you can only imagine the feelings that were coursing through me. Um, and then following later on that day, when my mum and dad separated, things began to, I'd never really experienced such a high and then such a low. And at 24, stopping playing was, was something that I never envisaged, walking away from the game that had, had brought me such joy. That's, um, that was something which was completely off field and out of field and, I didn't really know how to deal with myself or, or, or what I was or what I represented following that decision. But all I knew is I couldn't be in that environment anymore, which was crazy. And I had to try and make sense of it. You know, I had to try and uh, try and work out what on earth I was here for again in that sort of identity crisis um, on top of having, I suppose, the family name and people writing things like um, Fabian. You know, there's an article written about me. Fabian retires to support his twin brother writing lyrics on his music. I mean, that was not what I said to him. And they were sort of creating that as if I'd given up sport to become Julius's lyricist. Um, you know, little things like that just grate you a little bit. But um, the decision was made for my mental health. And um, on reflection, I've learned so much about myself as a result of that experience. And, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have it any other way looking back at it now. Do I still feel I could do a job playing professional cricket? I look at the T20s sometimes and the one-day stuff and definitely feel that I, I, I could slot in quite nicely still. Um, but it's, it's, it's behind me now, I think. So we're, uh, we're moving forward. Do you, do you still play recreationally? Yeah, so I play on the weekends uh, for, my, for my cricket club. I played a bit of league cricket. I'm now a mentor and a coach at Sutton Cricket Club in, in the uh, Surrey Championship. Um, they're in Division 1, looking to get up to the Premier League. And I bat number four for them. Um, and and just enjoy it a little bit more. Although there there's a there's a different kind of pressure playing in league cricket after playing professional cricket, which is you you should be getting a hundred every game, or at least everyone thinks you should. So it, it's it's gone from you know trying to fight for your place to being the first member on the team sheet and should be leading by example every time. So it's just a different kind of pressure. But it's um, as you get a bit older, you become a little bit more familiar with all of those things and can deal with it a bit better. Do people still come to watch you? My dad hasn't been to watch me yet, which is interesting. Um, but he 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 will get down. Um, not really, not really. A few people. I've had a few autographs to sign even now, which is crazy. I've been out the game four years, and you have people waiting on the side asking me to sign something. Um, but it's it is what it is, and the the name will will always be there. And and I still perform quite well at, at times in my cricket career, and I remember those times fondly. For any young athletes and young cricketers coming up nowadays, what, what advice do you have for them to, to protect their mental health and, and, and you know, stay, st stay happy, I guess, while playing cricket? But it's tricky because cricket is so stati statistical, statistical, whatever the word is, it's quite difficult to get it out. Um, <laughs> it's all about numbers. So, yeah. it, you know, when people are trying to find their feet, the performances speak for themselves. You can't hide anywhere. Um, but what I would say is cricket is just a game. Uh, I, I think sometimes cricket's made out to be more than that. 
it becomes a life it becomes everything it becomes their happiness their sadness it represents every emotion but if you simplify it to its simplest form it is just a game of cricket and for me it was it was when i wasn't playing i was practicing or thinking about it it became um completely immersive and i couldn't really escape that so also having an escape from that do you do you like to go and play golf do you like to write lyrics or whatever it might be you know do, what what makes you happy away from cricket and try and identify that and give yourself time to breathe uh, instead of becoming completely reliant on cricket to to serve your happiness so have a hobby and also take it in your stride it's just sport i guess that applies to doesn't just apply to sports people and cricketers and it doesn't just apply to using cricket or sport as as that thing that your your happiness is is fully dependent on i guess with a lot of people they use things such as even even relationships and their 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 happiness and their contentment is is tied to this external validation or even work people you have people who are addicted to work and we haven't even got into uh you know addiction to substances but you know just having that that over reliance on the external world and that being so important for you to i guess address or feel mm-hmm. good inside i think that that's such a that's such a common theme across industries and whether it's sport or cricket or anything mm-hmm. else so yeah this is so much so much deeper than than cricket or your job it's it's very much the moment you begin to to feel that contentment and that genuine contentment without reaching for external validation is when you actually can look in the mirror and say yeah, i actually quite like the the reflection i'm seeing i actually quite like the person that i am and that comes from a from a self love journey beginning really um and actually accepting your imperfections and sport was for me it was if you fail you get dropped you know there was no room for mediocrity there was no room for in my head there was no room for human error and the problem is that failure is a part of life and my attitude to failure was maybe because i was dropped every time that i didn't perform or i was almost taught in that environment that anything less than 100% out of me was not good enough and that created a, a lot of damaging emotions um so coming out of sport just to be easy on myself and accept that i'm not going to get everything right all the time i might play and miss at a few balls or you know metaphorically in life and i might i might make some mistakes but with that understanding that you know you got to at some point accept that you're not perfect and that you are going to you know make some pretty bad errors in your life just because you're human it gives you a lot more perspective on life and and actually it's important that you have that integrated into your mindset otherwise it's going to be a very very long and difficult journey isn't it yeah absolutely and it's interesting to hear you talk about this i'm i'm actually just wondering how you know how did you come to this realization how did you gain for lack of a better word how did you gain this wisdom you know go, going from the the bloke in 2016 mm. to to 5 years later like what's happened between now and then yeah yeah it's 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 a tricky question experience life um i had one option i could either continue to to suppress my emotions by thinking that everything was going to be perfect or i had to face myself and my reality and be like right this this version of me isn't working because i'm not thinking correctly and I had to speak to a lot of people. I visited Mike Brearley, the former England captain, who's a psychologist, to talk to him about a few things. And I had to learn about myself. Um, and by doing that, I had to face some of the, the emotions that I didn't want to face. And I had to go back to, to right to the roots of, of why I was feeling a certain way. Um, got, a, got some support from the PCA with my, for my mental health and just understand myself a bit better. Um, it came from you know the pressures actually stem from not loving myself from giving myself too much of a hard time um so i suppose suppose the wisdom has come from my recovery you know having to almost resurrect my mindset to 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 survive basically emotionally so you know looking over the years those creating experiences and that person that i was um is actually a bit of a blessing in disguise because it's led me to a number of things that i'm doing now where I can support people 
uh, and, and have sort of what my my mother might say is an old head on young shoulders <laughs> so it's it's exciting um to to sort of have refound myself and that that was a journey that i didn't didn't necessarily think was possible considering my adoration for sport and particularly cricket um so to be away from that and and be in a better place than i ever was playing cricket is unimaginable but it's the truth now and um happy for those for those uh, setbacks I definitely relate to what you just said, you know, being happy for the setbacks. I feel like suffering is a really, really good teacher. It, sometimes it feels like it just, it just will never end. So a few, basically right after being released from rehab, I was, I was in rehab for three months. Right after being released from rehab, I went through a phase where I was bed bound for eight months uh, with, with post-acute withdrawal syndrome. And the symptoms were, were crazy. They, they, in many ways, they mimicked chronic fatigue syndrome. So I basically, I could barely get out of bed. And if I went for a walk longer than 30 minutes, I'd completely crash. My brain didn't work. I had total brain fog. And it was really hard for me to have conversations and process thoughts. And this whole time, I just assumed, oh my God, my life is over. I don't know when this is going to end. And I had every reason to believe that's it. You know, this, this is my life and 25, you know, I made it to 25 and now I'm done. I have nothing else to, to contribute. So all of that and, and five to six years, probably five years of, of being an active addiction. Sometimes I look back on it. I'm like, how did that not completely destroy me? And if it wasn't for all of that, I, I would not be the person I am today i would not have the wisdom mm. that i have today and i in a in a strange way it's it's almost as if i had to go through that or mm. it, it was inevitable like it was just going to happen and now it's happened but it's it's in the past mm. you know yeah and so you know sometimes you know it's it's almost a blessing in disguise that it happened early on in life because you've got that that i suppose insight into what it takes to to, to become a good person or become the best version of you early on. Some people learn that later. Um, I think the one important thing from my point of view was that addiction to cricket that I had. I almost felt like I had to find it somewhere else in those years when I stopped, stopped playing. And it was only when I began to basically give up on trying to control everything that I was able to move forward, you know, not controlling results knowing that there was so much that I couldn't do anything about and that um, people's decisions or people's view on me is their decision, not mine. And when you begin to realize that, it just gives you this sort of emotional freedom um, that, you know, that addiction to something. Addiction is usually, you know, is described when I was learning life coaching is, is a relationship with past trauma that you're trying to suppress. Um, and for me, you know, I suppose in many ways coming out of cricket, addiction with, to cricket was my escape from some dark times growing up. Now, when I look at it like that, I think, crikey, maybe, although I loved cricket, maybe it was more in depth. It, was, it meant more to me. It was something that I had to have in order to escape from something else. So that's where the sort of interesting connection comes from. And you're right. You can get addicted to anything, can't you? People get addicted to the gym. And they say, oh, there's nothing wrong with me. Well, you're going to the gym three times a day. Um, you, you literally, that's damaging to your body. So it can literally be anything, but it's sort of recognizing where that addiction has come from uh, and working backwards and unwrapping it that way. And uh, it's really interesting to hear what, what you've gone through. And I'm, I'm happy that you've come out the other side as well. Yeah, thanks, Fabian. And, you know, like you said, what you've learned during your life coaching journey and something that was, that was you know, drilled into us in, in rehab, whether it's, you know, addiction to any sort of substance yeah. or whether it's anger, that's, that's usually a secondary thing. There's always something below that, some sort of, whether it's, it's trauma or an incorrect core belief that you have about yourself or about the world. And it's, it's always that thing under the surface. And if you can address that, it sort of takes it sort of takes care of everything else, and this whole addiction to substances it's it's a lot more complex than just a chemical hook. That's just mm. one layer. 
right so and you know i actually have a quote right here on a on a post it note about you know what you said about not being able to control what what other people think of you and, and not being able to control what happens so it's by uh it's it's about it's by stoic philosopher epictetus don't demand that things happen as you wish but wish that they happen as they do happen and you will go on well i love it oh, i think i think it's a brilliant quote um yeah i mean when i look at some of my friends who what they might use alcohol maybe to suppress something in their life and that they become reliant on that when they're stressed oh can i have a glass of wine you know and they they use things that sabotage their emotions so they can escape it without ever having to to really face them i think the self love journey when someone's trying to recover from something happens when you withdraw those self sabotaging behaviors because in that position you have to then face addiction or you have to face your traumas and you have to deal with it the the thing is we we go so many people go through the whole of their life suppressing it with substances or or you know even gym or whatever it might be and and um that's quite a sad i think that's quite a sad thing because you never realize what your real value is internally and how much you can grow to love yourself and your imperfections without completely taking a step back from those self sabotaging behaviors i know you have to go pretty soon so why don't you just tell all of us what you're doing nowadays uh in your life post cricket with with cal corner and uh mm. and and your your life coaching journey and and your podcast as well sure um uh, i mean there's quite a lot going on i think lockdown definitely opened my eyes to a few things personally which is where the life coaching came in i got my level 1 and level 2 um life coaching qualifications so i'm working with a number of of clients at the moment which is which is fantastic it's eye opening it's um it's great to have an impact on people and the coaching is all about forward thinking it's all about what can we do in the present to to build a better future instead of dwelling over the past it is um using using the present moment to make a difference and that that difference to therapy which is basically uncovering and unwrapping past trauma we're very much in the moment and move forward and that really works with with everything that I've been through in cricket and then cow corner um we basically transfer vital skills that athletes have into the workspace or or use sport as as an entertaining tool for people's clients so around england india this summer we we're we're entertaining 100 clients of one of our partners with uh on the evening of the lords test between england and india but with david gower graham gooch and my father chris cowdry hosting it so that'll be a good night for them and um I absolutely love uh, love what I'm doing at the moment yeah it's it's it can be really challenging um having to 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 be an entrepreneur and and work all the time towards goals um but as long as I try not to control everything and have that perspective on life and be grateful for what I do have and that sort of mindset it allows you to to get through each day and I've taken the pressure off of uh of performance every single day because i know that that's not human <laughs> which is which is the big difference from playing to now just to round things off fabian if people want to find you on social media or wherever where do they go how do they find you sure i suppose the easiest place would be instagram um i i i post quite regularly there i think you'll find if you follow me and and i'm at fabian k cowdry on on instagram and um if you want to talk to me about coaching or or anything in particular drop me a dm or go through my website and i'd be delighted to support but thanks so much for having me on jay